I invite you all to cogitate about, well, about the world. It's vast, it's wondrous, it's ironic, it's confusing. There's no doubt that the complexities of the world make it difficult to put some things into perspective. For example, take the reoccurring themes of good and evil. You see, the concepts of good and evil long predate you and me. Right? Their conceptual capture has been attempted by Shakespeare, their philosophical framework by Plato, and their flamboyant manifestations by the likes of CNN and Fox, none of which, I assure you, did anything for me. Uh, I actually found myself in the same space of understanding after I picked up that play or uh, turned on that broadcast as I did before, until I identified another form for understanding. So allow me to explain to you all the concepts of good and evil in a way that I think everybody in this room will understand. Does everybody know who this is? Superman, right? AKA Clark Kent. Or is it Clark Kent, AKA Superman? Well, you know, that doesn't matter right now. Let's table that and come back to it a little bit later. For now, let's focus on the character. You see, Superman in the DC universe is widely regarded the most powerful. Right? He has super strength, obviously, super speed, possesses the power of flight, can shoot laser beams out of his eyes, and so much more. Which is why, understandably for him, with great power comes great responsibility. But what good is all that power if there's no need to use it? I mean, let's be very clear. Superman's powers aren't designed to catch a petty thief or mediate an uncomfortable situation. I mean, so one has to ask themselves, does Superman exist because certain levels of evil exist? Or do certain levels of evil exist because Superman exists? And what's fascinating about this conversation is that it's through this discussion that we learn about the inevitable, yet surprisingly obvious symbiosis that exists between good and evil. Philosophers and educators forever have debated whether or not these two concepts could exist in solidarity. Yet it's Superman that teaches us, no, they can't. How? Good question. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, so if you think about it, the question is how? Well, you remember when I said that we would revisit this guy's alter ego? Well, this is Clark Kent, newspaper reporter, journalist from Kansas who lives in Metropolis and works at the Daily Planet. And that's really all he is. Unless he wants him to become Superman. This is Lex Luthor, for those who don't know. Superman's sort of arch nemesis and the main antagonist, really, of the DC universe. You see, Lex is this dangerous, xenophobic, egotistical, billionaire trust fund kid who, by way of inheritance, created a billion dollar brand, billion dollar company, and now finds himself in the White House as President of the United States. <laughs> I didn't even get to the punchline. Oh, but seriously though, uh, everything Lex does is to rid the world of Superman. Right? He can't bear the thought that there is somebody else out there that the people of America and of the world want as their savior. So Lex sort of creates these, these uh, manipulative plans to sort of paint Superman as the enemy while he graces in the, the joys of being the good guy. But here's what gets interesting. You see, Superman needs Lex Luthor in order to fulfill his own prophecy of donning the cape, of being that Superman that we all know. Remember, early in the canons, Lois Lane, his love interest, doesn't fancy Clark Kent too much. Her eyes are for Superman. So Superman needs Lex Luthor to try to fulfill his own prophecy, which is he is the all unifying leader of the world. In other words, Superman the hero needs Lex Luthor the villain in order to exist, the same way that Lex Luthor the villain needs Superman the hero in order to exist. And comic books taught me that. They taught me how to understand abstract concepts such as good and evil, right and wrong, right? Good versus bad, and of course, heroes versus villains. One thing you'll sort of see a lot of today and will come very clear is my love for the comic universe. Ever since I can remember, comics have been with me. You know, one thing I've always loved about them is their ability to have characters stand for something. Right? They're all unique and serve as a symbol for adults and children alike in the name of hope and even despair. I invite you all to think about your sort of favorite fictional character. It doesn't have to be comic related, but just think about them and ask yourself, what is it about this character or these groups of individuals that attracts you to them? I know for me, when I was a boy, I was attracted to sort of what characters did and how they did them, rather than sort of why they did what they did or who they were as individuals. You know, it was the fact that the Hulk was the strongest that I loved him. It was the fact that the Flash was the fastest 
that I would channel him when racing my friends. You know, it was the fact that Storm couldn't control the elements, that I loved her. You know, as a kid growing up in Boston, you wanted to get out of those winters somehow, even if it was in your imagination. But it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I began to look at comic books a little bit differently. I grew less and less interested in, you know, the super speed and the super strength of Quicksilver and Ben Grimm, and more interested in the origins. I was sort of moved by the sense of guilt that Spider-Man felt knowing that he couldn't save Uncle Ben. I was fascinated by the sense of desolation that Rogue from X-Men feels knowing that she can never touch another human being or mutant again with her bare hands. My talk today is designed to illustrate for you all not just that comic books are a reflection of our everyday lives, but that they can also serve as a viable medium for understanding the world around us, allowing us to identify our own origin stories, but only if we look under the page. Now, this next admission may not come as much of a surprise to people who know me, but I'm a major Batman fan. <laughs> it's supposed to be more dramatic than it was, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, I, I have a, a bat cave on the property, which is really just a garage. <laughs> I drive a, a Batmobile, which is really just an all-black Dodge Charger. <laughs> but I didn't always like Batman. Matter of fact, when I was younger, I thought he was a very basic superhero because of what he was unable to do. And again, it wasn't until I got to graduate school that I started thinking differently. I remember being in my theory and development class, and the professor uh, had us create an identity theory. And so I liked Batman at the time, not as much as I do now, but I did. And so I wanted to be silly, and I was like, I'll use Batman as a baseline for this identity theory. So I started dancing with you know, the hero complex that people say he has, and some of the diagnoses that his villains have received while being in Arkham, just to get the conversation started. I used to post conversations on Facebook to kind of engage folks in these discussions. And one thing I remember posting, I recall it, it was, when casting for a Batman movie, is it more important to cast for Batman or for Bruce Wayne? And then it dawned on me. These two folks are two very different personalities. They're not one and the same. Right? You have Bruce Wayne, who is the billionaire playboy philanthropist who uses his riches to keep Gotham on the map. And then you have Batman, who we all know is this vengeful, cape-crusading dark knight who has sworn to rid the streets of Gotham of its injustices. And though I am neither of those, despite the suit, I'm not rich, I'm not a billionaire, uh, and I'm not a crime fighter in that sense, I do fully understand what it means to live sort of a dualistic lifestyle. You know, as a person who admittedly has some pretty serious trust issues, but works in a field that's heavily predicated upon relationships and relationship building, in a sense, I have to become somebody else. Not being disingenuine, but really activate a piece of my identity that I otherwise wouldn't. Not only to participate effectively and at a high level, but to also be the administrator that the University of Arizona needs me to be. And Batman not only taught me that that was OK, but he taught me that that was common because it was in literature. You know, as I'm talking to you all, my brain's just going everywhere, and we're digressing a little bit. So I think about, right, January 21st, 2017. This was the date of the Women's March on Washington and also the, the largest single-day protest in American history. Now, reasons for the Women's March range far and wide. We had women's rights, environmental rights, topics of sexuality, and everything else in between. These weren't new to people. For as long as society's been around, so have women's issues. So why is it that we've struggled to understand the, the issues and, and, and the, the conflicts that women face? I mean, after all, two years from now will be the centennial of the 19th Amendment, which we all know granted women the right to vote. But why is it that we are confused as to how this looks? We can't really appreciate women's struggles unless we pay attention to Wonder Woman. Diana Prince, Princess of the Amazons. Far and away, one of the best characters in all of fiction, and for a comic enthusiast like myself, easily a first round draft pick. <laughs> but if you look at her rogues gallery, that is her villains, you'll notice that they're not that impressive. And for someone who has a skill set and status that very much mirrors Superman, who we spoke about, you have to ask yourself why. And the answer lies under the page. Wonder Woman's enemies have never been the folks on the comic book page. They've always been, as she says, a man's world or the patriarchal structures that govern society. Her books teach us about the atrocities that have occurred in history and presently, and how they're very much linked to sort of male-dominated societies. They've taught us about how the suppression of her sisters and daughters have everything to do with patriarchal structures. 
And she even talks about how toxic masculinity can be a detriment to our boys and our men. Check this out. There's a DVD and a comic book called Justice League War. And in this series, there's a segment where there are protesters that are protesting Wonder Woman. And they're really going off on her about her outfit and her person. She comes over and is being led by this guy who's standing on a car. And so she comes over and says, this is not your truth to this individual. So she takes out her lasso of truth, which has people tell the truth, compel them to, throws it around him, this is not your truth, tightens it, now speak your truth. To which the guy said, I have Wonder Woman posters in my house and in my room. Uh, and I, at times I cross-dress as Wonder Woman because it makes me feel powerful. <laughs> Wonder Woman chuckled as well. Said to him, I'll never forget it. Don't be ashamed. My suit makes me feel powerful too. Embrace who you are. Now, I don't know about you, but there aren't many works of fiction, and really works of nonfiction, except in the academic world, that really attack toxic masculinity head on. So next time you ask yourself why Wonder Woman is fighting particular characters, remember, that's not her fight. Her fight is in the social realm. While we're talking about social movements, I have to explain the 1960s, an era that was well documented with racism. Uh, you know, and a lot of black activists led the way, probably most prominent, uh, sort of Dr. King and Malcolm X. Uh, Dr. King believed in equality through peace, said that uh, we, we should not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. Malcolm X believed that uh, it wasn't about black equality, but black liberation. He said if you took your coffee strong, black, that meant it was strong. It wasn't until you integrated it with cream and milk that it became weak. Uh, <laughs> this is Charles Xavier on the left, and that's Magneto on the right from X-Men. Why am I showing you this? How about now? X-Men is really predicated upon this social discourse between humans and mutants. Humans. Uh, and sort of our, uh, the fictional adaptation of white Americans, and mutants, black Americans. You see, the Senator Kelly, who's a prominent political figure in the, the series, is a representation of Governor George Wallace from Alabama of the 60s. And the Sentinels, whose job was to capture, imprison, and sometimes kill mutants, are a reflection of who? I know you don't want to say it, I'll say it for you. The police state at the time. At the time? Yeah, the police state. Uh, and in doing so, um, it, it sort of sent waves through the comic book world. But none more prominent than sort of Professor Xavier and Magneto. Professor Xavier is a reflection of Martin Luther King. Xavier believes also in peace or equality through peace, but uh, he understands that folks have to do what they have to do sometimes. He uses his telepathy to uh, speak to his oppressors and his, and his supporters. Magneto, on the other hand, doesn't believe in intermingling between humans and mutants. He believes that uh, when Malcolm X said blacks are just Africans in America, Magneto says humans are born and not created. Now, I know we threw a lot of information at you today, but if you don't leave with anything, I want you to leave with this. The reality of fantasy is that fantasy is reality. And it is through this truth that we're able to refer to comic books as a way to contextualize the world around us, both past and present. It is because of X-Men that we can identify white immunity. It's because of Batman that we can say yes to self-discovery. It is because of, of Wonder Woman that we can choose to believe to be our authentic selves. The very essence of humanity as a part of a character's development and purpose is the very thing that takes heroes and villains from mere images on a comic book page and turns them into profound symbols for people like me. And if we choose to look under the page, then maybe we too can embark on our own hero journey and reimagine the world and channel ourselves into the uncharted. Thank you very much.